went in to make this film, it wasn't to be famous. I don't like doing these type of things. It's not, it's not who I am, it's not what I do. But I want people to, to know that this doesn't end because it's two years on. This doesn't end because it's not in the newspapers every day. I want this to be some kind of insight as to what my life is like. I was a young man going to work and then I had my life changed in ways that I could never, never imagine. If somebody would have said to me three years ago, look, you're going to lose both your legs, you're going to lose your eye, you're going to have heart attacks, you'll be medicated for the rest of your life, I'd be like, me, my, my life's over. But the fact that somebody tries to kill you, that's a big incentive to, to live your life and just say that you don't win. You can exist or you can live. I've chose to live my life. Danny Biddle was the most seriously injured survivor of the 7th of July bombings. He was less than a metre away from Mohammed Sadiq Khan when he detonated his bomb on the Edgware Road tube. This is Danny's own account of his ordeal, his remarkable survival and of the long road to recovery. Today, Danny lives in a specially converted bungalow with his wife Lisa. Danny, you want pickle? Yeah, please. Yeah. We're just a normal young married couple that were thrown in the middle of something that was so horrendous, it was unbelievable, but we just want a normal life. We want to start a family, we, we want to be happy and healthy and, and do everything that, that every other normal married couple do. I don't look at him and think, oh, victim. I look at him and think, Dan, I'm going to take the pee out of him because that's how we've always been and why change now? Danny has surpassed all expectations with his physical recovery, but dealing with mental trauma is an ongoing battle. There isn't a day that goes by where I don't think about it or I don't have a memory or, or a flashback about it in a, a quiet moment at home or on the drive to work. There, there's always something there, that a smell, a sound, a, a, a movement that will remind me of that day. That morning, I woke up my usual time. I had a, a, a banging migraine. So I sort of woke Lisa up and said, I'm not feeling so good, I don't think I'm going to go in. So I laid back down, went back to sleep, and I woke up about half hour later. And I felt a little bit better, so I decided that I'd, I'd get up and, and go to work. So by the time I'd got up, showered, got me work gear on, got me laptop bag, got me briefcase, got me phone and everything together and actually walked out the door, I was about 45 minutes to an hour later than, than I should have been. Right, I'll see you tonight. OK, then. I'll see you later. Have a good day. Yeah, you too. I was very active, very fit. I loved playing football, going fishing, playing squash. Height-wise, I was about 6'4". I was pushing 19 stone, so I used to go to the gym a lot. Jumped on the bus, and there was a burst water main that kept me sitting on the bus for about another 40 minutes. I think I got to the station about 10 past 7. And then, just sod's law, the ticket machine was out of order, so I had to queue up to buy the ticket. If I'd have got up on time, would that main have been burst? Would that ticket machine have been working? It's one of the things that, that I look back and I could, if only I'd done this, if only I'd done that, and if only is probably the two harshest words we have in our language. So when we actually reached Liverpool Street, run down to the, the platform in a circle line, as I got to the platform, a train had just pulled in and it was, it was packed with people. And I knew I was, was late anyway, so I thought, well, I'm not going to make myself uncomfortable. I looked at the board, it said the next one was sort of two to three minutes away, so I waited for that. When 
when I got on the train, I started to punch in a text message to send to the, the lad that I was working with to let him know I was late. I'm totally crap at text messaging. I mean, the predictive test makes no sense to me whatsoever, so singly trying to punch in each letter took a lot longer than, than for most people it would, and I missed my stop. Unknown to Danny, he was just three feet from suicide bomber Mohammed Sadiq Khan. This guy didn't have I'm a suicide bomber tattooed on him. He got on a train, he was a young guy dressed in casual clothes, carrying a rucksack, like millions of other people do, day in, day out, travelling around London. And I looked round and kind of made eye contact with him as he looked up. And it's terrifying to think that when I've looked at him, I, was a, I could have been the last thing he saw, and I, there could have been something about me that, that triggered it. Seconds after the train left Edgware Road Station, Khan placed his hand in his rucksack. The train only made it a few metres into the tunnel. Since the 7th of July bombings, Danny Biddle has had to come to terms with his disability. And I can't live my life as that person anymore through, through no fault of my own. I, I just can't do it. What's left is the, the person that I've had to fight and struggle to rebuild ever since that bomb went off. I'm a long way in front of where a lot of people thought I would be 22 months after the bombings, that's for sure. He used to be a project manager in construction, but it's a job he can no longer do. Instead, he's retrained and combined his existing skills with his recent experiences as a disabled man. This has opened up a new career as an accessibility specialist. It was a real big goal of mine while I was in hospital to get back to work, to give me the, the sort of sense of independence and give me a, a bit of my, my pride and dignity back because you, you do kind of lose all of that in hospital when you're in there for so long. Since the bombing, I could sort of exuberate the self-confidence because people tend to sort of look past you when you're in a wheelchair. If you're out in a group of people, they'll, they'll talk to the people around you and not you because you're in a chair. They sort of look at me and say, oh, how's he doing? And I kind of think, well, I'm, I'm sitting there. It, it's, I've lost my legs, not my tongue. I, everything still functions as it should. I just don't have legs anymore. Danny was given £118,000 in compensation for his injuries. But his decision to go back to work meant a cut in his disability living allowance. The initial problem that, that you're going to have as a disabled person trying to use the toilet is that handrail really doesn't serve any purpose. I went back to work because I wanted to, because work is a big part of my life and it's important to me. It shouldn't have been a necessity for me to do it. But the compensation doesn't go far enough for the next, hopefully, 50, 60 years of my life. I mean, probably 10 years' time, it would have all gone. So I need to work. When I'm in excruciating pain, or I haven't slept for two days, I've still got to drag my sorry ass out of bed and go to work, because the government don't compensate enough for, for an act of terrorism. Although he tries to avoid it, Danny has to drive through London for work. Coming through tunnels and underpasses, sort of like this, the, the Limehouse Link, it makes me go cold. My mind just races and the thoughts of, of where I was lying and why, where I was trapped and the fear of not being able to move or get out, they start to creep up inside again. The most disturbing flashbacks take him back into the tube tunnel and the immediate moments after he was blown out of the carriage. I've never heard screaming like I heard that day. You're listening to people who are terrified. I listen to people screaming, and when the screaming stops, it's because they've died. It's not because they've got out and walked away from it. I listen to people die. I watch people die. It's absolutely fucking terrifying. I wanted to try and move, but I just did a big lump of metal, which I later found out was a, a carriage door on top of me. I put my hands under the door to try and like use leverage to try and push the door off. As I put my hand down by my left side, it was 
the only way to describe it, like, I put my hand in a bucket of paper mache, there was just nothing there. I put my hand down and I could feel the rocks and, and just go for want of a better term, which I later found out I'd actually put my hand inside my leg. My left leg had been blown clean off, so it was just blood pouring out of it and just nothing there. At that point, I started to panic really badly. Um, started screaming for help. My face was stinging, my face got quite badly burnt as well. So I've reached up to touch my face because my face was wet and stinging. And as I did, I felt my forehead and the texture didn't feel right. So as I've moved my hand back, I couldn't then lift my hand off my forehead. And what I'd done, where the, the front of my head had been split open, I'd put my hand on my skull and pushed back and I now had my hand under my scalp. So as I did that, it was my fingers hitting the skin that wouldn't allow me to pull my hand out. So at that point, I started to, to scream quite loudly. Um, started shouting for help. I needed somebody to find me. It wasn't at that point about being rescued, it was about somebody finding me and knowing who I was, that I was actually somebody that got a family. And I needed those people to know that I was thinking of them. Danny's screams cut through the chaos. They reached passenger Adrian Hiley, who was still on the train. There were screams of fear and screams of pain. I think he was just scared of the environment where he was. Hey, I can hear you, I can hear you. All of a sudden, I had a, a voice shout back, I can hear you, what's, what's your name? I can help you, what's your name? He said, my name's Adrian. He said, where are you? I'm going to carry on talking to you, I need to hear your voice. I tried to find out if he could stand up, if he could walk if he could move at all. He told me he couldn't. He was pinned under a piece of metal. <coughs> Adrian had combat experience from Kosovo, where he served as an army medic. He was better placed than anyone on the train to deal with bomb injuries. Also drawn to Danny was Lee Hunt, a tube driver who had run into the tunnel from Edgware Road Station. He too was a former soldier. I was standing looking at the, the, the first victim, taking in the, the whole surroundings and then heard Danny screaming. At the same time, I saw Adrian coming down towards me. Hey, mate. Hey, do you work, do you work down there? Yes, mate. You're okay. The two ex-soldiers knew that they had to reach Danny quickly, but he was trapped on the other side of the train. It kind of chilled it to the bone to hear. You know, he was obviously very upset, uh, very scared. He, you know, he was on his own. Danny, I've got Leo with me. All right, he works on the underground. We're coming to you now, just hang in there. It's, it's kind of like me and Adrian looked at each other and both knew what we were going to do. I ran round the back of the train because uh, I didn't know that electricity had been turned off. Adrian, however, went <laughs> underneath the train over the rails. Um, very brave thing to do. My priority was to get to Danny, which meant going underneath the carriages and coming up against the wall where Danny was. Danny. Danny. It was just a, a massive sense of relief that, that I'd been found, that, that I wasn't going to die on my own. All right, we can get you out of here. All right, Lee. All right, this is Lee. He's from the underground, OK? He's going to help us. We noticed that one of the doors or one of the side panels of the train had actually landed on Danny. So first, we've just got to get this off you, OK? <coughs> <coughs> You know, we could see the, the state of his legs. Um, we, we could see that he'd lost a lot of blood. OK. Danny's left leg was completely severed above the knee. His right was severely lacerated. The foot turned 180 degrees, facing backwards. Adrian was kneeling in front of me. And uh, he said, hold Lee's hands. So I just put my hand up and, and had hold of Lee's hands. And I just remember him saying, look, I haven't lost anybody yet. 
There was a chance maybe Danny wouldn't make it. But I wasn't I wasn't prepared to accept that. There were only minutes to stop Danny from bleeding to death. Adrian took a lead with nothing more than his bare hands at his disposal. Danny, I need you to hold. I need you to hold on to me. Brace yourself, this is gonna fucking hurt, okay? And I thought, well, this ain't gonna be good. And I just bled out the lay's hands. <laughs> I did notice that there was a lot of blood coming from there, so you would have. I did put my hand on the van and, and stop it. <coughs> that's good, that's good. Just bite your teeth. Just bite it. Well, you try to grab your forefinger and your thumb and just press down as hard as you can to try and stop it. Next, they made tourniquets and tied Danny's legs. Well, a tourniquet is if you want to last resort to cut off blood supply to an extremity that is damaged. Just keep talking to me, mate. Just keep talking to me. The war zone first aid helped to stem the blood loss. Now, the task was to keep Danny conscious. Who's your team? Arsenal. Arsenal. Lee and Adrian were amazing, as I've said before. You meet special people throughout your life, but I've never, ever met extraordinary people until that day. Yeah, well, I'll tell you what, I'll buy you a pint when we get out of this, Danny, as well. Yeah, I'll get him one, too. He knows a rugby supporter, <laughs> right? Oh. If it wasn't for Adrian and Lee finding me, both coming from a, a military background, I wouldn't be here doing this now. Danny remained in Lee and Adrian's care until paramedics arrived. He was given emergency pain relief, after which a fire crew lifted him from the station on a stretcher. My last memory of Edgware Road is just the, the blue of the Edgware Road sign as they carried me out the entrance and, and put me in the ambulance. Just the noise outside, the sirens and the shouting and the police shouting and it just even now I hear a siren, it makes me go cold because I can just remember that real sharp pitch of sirens just flying about all over the place. So again, it's just another thing that, that stays with me from that day. Danny was rushed to nearby St Mary's Hospital. Early reports of the attack were filtering through. Hearing the breaking news, Danny's fiance Lisa tried to contact him. They kept saying that people were making their way home because the like, transport network had gone down and the buses weren't running. As the day went on, the dread got more and more, but you still don't want to let yourself believe it. Scotland Yard has issued a special telephone number for anyone concerned about friends or relatives. The number to ring is... We registered him on the telephone number and been waiting for a phone call, nothing came. Unable to get through to her fiancé and with mounting concerns, Lisa telephoned Danny's parents, who live in Spain. Lisa said there's been a terrorist attack in London. It seems quite severe. Danny was on the train going to London. She's unable to get him on his mobile. This happened to, to me before with my eldest son. He was, he was actually in, in New York when the planes went into the towers. And when that happened, I just continually phoned him every two minutes on the mobile and eventually he picked up. So I'm doing that exactly same situation to Danny, thinking he's going to answer the phone in a minute. Come on, Dan, don't be silly, answer the phone. Something in the back of my head just was there the whole time. It was just, I felt that, you know, there was, Dan was involved in some way. I just couldn't get the feeling of the fact that he'd been involved out of my, my brain. There is a bit of confusion as to what has caused this. It was a fairly eerie 10, 15 minutes when we were getting mixed messages from the media about what was happening. There was just a big explosion and all the lights in the carriage went out. Then all of a sudden, the doors to the recess bay burst open and in arrived Danny, our very first patient. One of the A&E doctors come over and pulled the, the blanket off of me 
And he, he just stood there and he said something like, Jesus, or, well, shit, and just made a phone call. And within seconds, I was just surrounded by people, consultants, surgeons, nurses, doctors. It was like en masse, all these people just got to me at once. Multiple injuries, leg hanging off, and Danny still awake and talking to us. It was, it was pretty horrific. The blood loss from Danny's legs was critical. As well as stemming this, they had to replace the lost fluids. He was sedated as the medical team tried to gain control over his body. In the last memory of A&E is one of the consultants just leant over me and went, Daniel, we'll take care of you. You're in hospital, we're going to take good care of you. There probably was a bit of defiance that, you know, Danny had survived and made it to hospital and that, we, you know, we were going to do everything we could to make sure that he survived this. But the nature of his injuries was such that he'd actually already lost so much blood uh, before he got to us uh, that we were very much catching up and we didn't catch up as quickly as we would have liked to. Despite the efforts of medical staff, Danny's heart was giving up. Deprived of blood, he had a cardiac arrest. It would not be his last. After being blown out of a tube train, Danny Biddle was rushed to St Mary's Hospital in a critical condition. When we got the message over the radio that we were going to expect a patient with multiple injuries and so on, now I wasn't expecting it was going to be as bad as this. A lot of my uh, members on my team, actually the minute they suddenly, <laughs> their hearts sank into their boots. Within minutes of arriving, Danny had a cardiac arrest. His heart was restarted and he was rushed into emergency surgery. That first few seconds made one realize that he had injuries about as severe as one can get. There was one leg which was already missing with lots of shrapnel injuries. The other leg was still there, but it's seriously and severely damaged, which part of it was only hanging by the skin. He was burnt over large areas of his upper body. His face was severely lacerated. It was like a war zone. And we actually had like two operating teams running simultaneously. And separately, we had two scrub nurses, two surgeons operating at the same time. Once he was stabilized, we got on with the job of removing the severely burnt and damaged tissue. However, just minutes into the operation, he suffered another cardiac arrest. Initially, cardiac massage, external cardiac massage was applied, but it soon became obvious that that was not sufficient. The team tried everything they could, but Danny's heart would not respond. They were left with one final option. The cardiothoracic surgeon who was present therefore opened the chest and she did this by incising between the fifth and the sixth rib and making a hole big enough for her to put her hands in there directly onto the heart and massaging it rhythmically like that. The heart was pumped by hand for 15 minutes until it finally began to beat on its own. We will get but Danny was still losing blood at a critical rate. They had to find the source of the leak. I tell you what we need is By that stage, he received about 25 to 30 units of blood, and that's the more than three, four times the blood volume for any, any patient. The leak was traced to a ruptured spleen. This had to be removed immediately. The more he bleeds, the more he's going to lose the battle. You don't have time to sit down and think about it, because if you think you've lost him, you will have lost him. With the spleen cut out, Danny became stable enough to move on to the main surgery, the amputation of his legs. The amputation on the left had to be undertaken just below the hip in a way that we could save as much length of the limb as possible. His right lower limb was also very severely injured, but at a lower level. The operation was complete by 4 p.m. and Danny was transferred to intensive care. 
eight pounds of loose change that had been blown into his flesh had also been removed. But a 20 pence coin, too difficult to cut out, is still inside him today. Every doctor that I've ever had to see through the events of that day or they've read my notes, they all say that I shouldn't have survived. But it, it goes back to just to how good a hospital St Mary's is. You often hear people say, I, I owe my life to such and such. I genuinely owe my life to Mr Black and, and his team. It was only as the 7th of July drew to a close, with Danny in intensive care, that his fiancée Lisa found out he was in hospital. The doorbell rang and I thought Dan's home, so I ran downstairs, got there before my dad, whose bedroom's nearer, and managed to overtake him on the stairs, opened the front door and there was two policemen standing there. And they was like, as soon as they turned up, I thought, right, you know, obviously something, something dreadful's happened. Lisa arrived at hospital to find her fiance in a medically induced coma. I mean, you know, Dalton, I'll put it very succinctly, said, uh, like, negative thought doesn't help. And from then on, really, as a family, we, we were totally focused on Danny. It was a minute-by-minute minute thing with Danny for, for a long while. They was just not sure whether he was going to pull through it. The most dangerous part for Danny and people injured as severely as he was is, funnily enough, not the actual operating period. It's the days and weeks afterwards. When one transfuses large amounts of blood, the body reacts to that and the various organs fail, the heart, the lungs, the kidneys. Danny also needed further surgery to his legs. And on the 12th of July, his left eye was removed. It was quite kind of scary because you were nearly frightened to go near him and touch him, do anything, because he just looked so ill. There was a lot of changes happening with Danny, but the overall picture was still that he was very critically unwell. When I met the relatives, I came to realise how important they were in his rehabilitation and, I think, survival. They were at his bedside for the entire five weeks. As Danny's organs adjusted to the new blood, the sedation was reduced. He drifted in and out of consciousness. When I woke up, I still thought it was Thursday. I still thought it was the 7th of July. My first real memories is everybody being around me. Because I'd been burnt and my retina in my eye had been burnt, everybody looked suntanned. Four hours ago, I'd, I'd just been blown out of a tube train, and yet they've had an holiday. They've, they've all been on holiday. How, how's, how does this work? Dan? Danny, can you hear me? As his consciousness increased, Danny became haunted by his memories of the 7th of July. He was finding it very hard to sleep and um, getting very anxious and stressed. <laughs> I remember one night, one of the ICU nurses, Noreen, come up to me and said, like, you've got to sleep, you really need to sleep. He kind of turned around to me and he said, you don't see what I see when I close my eyes. She knew that it, it was there. I could remember it. And every time I shut my eyes, it was like I'd been picked up and dumped back in that tunnel. It, it takes a lot to leave me without words, but that day I was kind of like, oh yeah, what do I say back to that? There was nothing I really could say. None of us will ever see what he sees when he closes his eyes. By now, Danny was breathing through a tracheotomy, so communication was by notes or lip reading. We were all pussyfooting round about his amputations and not saying anything for him, didn't know what he knew. And uh, one of the consultants said that it's far better that Danny be told the extent of his injuries sooner than later. I had my dad one side and Lisa the other and they're holding my hands 
and he's running through my injuries and he said, he said, Danny, I'm sorry, you've lost both your legs. So there was like this intake of breath as my dad and Lisa were expecting me to just totally freak out. And I just shrugged my shoulders. And he said, you understand what I'm telling you? We've, you've lost both your legs, we've amputated your legs. And again, I just, I just shrugged my shoulders. As a father, I mean, I've never been so proud of my son. He took it so manfully. In mid-August, a major milestone in Danny's recovery was reached. He left intensive care and transferred to a ward. From this point, he was slowly reintroduced to the world. It's very protected in intensive care. It's a one-on-one -on -one relationship with the nurses. But certainly when you come to a ward environment, you are mixing with changeover of staff and a lot of staff on a daily basis, and also patients around you. He couldn't get himself sitting up in the bed. He couldn't get himself out into a chair, to the bathroom, you know, even just moving himself. He had to relearn how to do everything, basically. I just wanted to, to pull the curtains around a cubicle and, and pretend that, that nobody else was there. So instead of it being like, this is a kickstart, I get my life back, it's like, Jesus Christ, haven't I gone through enough? Just let me lay here and watch telly all day. The staff at St Mary's, they never let me do that. They always said, no, this is what we're going to do, and we're going to do it. And again, thanks to them that, that it kick-started my, my recovery. That's when I had to then deal with what had happened to me. I had to accept that I, that I didn't have legs. I had to accept that I only had one eye. I had no idea how much scar I had to my face. I knew I had this big cut on my head, but I had no idea what I was going to look like. And, and even that, looking back on it now, when I asked for a mirror and wanted to know what I looked like, people were a bit like, oh, is this such a good idea? And I was like, just give me the mirror, I've got to see sooner or later. And, and people find it strange, but when I looked at myself, I laughed. I, because my, the first thing I said to my mum and dad was I'd make a great Bond villain, because I've got a, a full beard, I haven't had a shave in nine weeks, I'm covered in scars, I've got an eye missing. I'd, Blofeld had nothing on me the way I looked. Danny spent nearly three months in St Mary's Hospital. Physically, he improved significantly, and he worked hard to build up strength. He began applying for compensation through the Criminal Injuries Compensation Authority. Just like going for an Argos book, you, you get the book and you say, right, I'm going to claim for losing both my legs. So they say, OK, losing both your legs is X amount of pounds. So then they say, OK, what was your next most serious injury? So you then go through the book and you, you price up your most expensive body part. So I said, OK, losing my eye was my next most expensive injury. So then they say, OK, well, we paid you out 100% of losing both your legs, but because you were stupid enough to get another injury, we're going to deduct 70% of that monetary value. And heaven forbids if you'd be stupid enough to get a third injury, you get 15% of that value. And you can only claim for three injuries. So for the heart attacks, the lung damage, the kidney damage, the burns, the scarring, I can't claim for that. I can't claim for mental trauma. The third injury Danny claimed for was the loss of his spleen. His immune system is permanently weakened without it. For the spleen, I'm due a payment of £440, um, which is 15% of, of the total value. What really annoys me is that I didn't lose 15% of my spleen. It was taken out. It's been incinerated in a mortuary somewhere. I didn't lose 30% of my eye. They took the whole thing out. I, I'd like to get it back and I'd post it to the people at the CICA and go, there, that's how much of it I lost, all of it. Not 30% of it, I lost a lot. In early autumn 2005, Danny was transferred to the Douglas Bardi unit at Queen Mary's Hospital in Roehampton. It's a world-renowned centre of excellence for the rehabilitation of amputees. Danny was with us for probably about seven to eight months and throughout that time obviously we got to know him very well as a character. From a physio point of view we would concentrate very much on making him be as independent as possible in terms of like his wheelchair mobility. His commitment to rehab was amazing um, and he'd always be down in the gym um, persevering with his exercises but at the back of his mind I think he was obviously going through severe psychological issues in terms of how each week he was going to manage things and to cope really for the rest of his life. 
The big question at Roehampton was whether prosthetics would be suitable for Danny. A pair of legs were custom built for him. In November 2005, he began to learn how to use them. It has been said that for someone that's lost both legs effectively above the knee, or in Danny's case, one leg above the knee and one leg through the knee, the statistics show that someone uses about 300% more energy in learning to walk. Oh. If you're trying to climb the steepest mountain and going against a really severe gale force wind and that effort just takes your breath away. Um, that's really what Dan is going through in the early stages of, of learning to walk again. By April 2006, Danny was supposed to be married to Lisa, his fiance of five years. Instead, they were living apart, him in a small hospital room and her a three-hour round trip away. But their plans remained intact, and getting married gave Danny an added incentive to walk. We was adamant we were still going to get married. That's always been the plan. But I wanted on that day to, to be the same person I was when I asked Lisa to marry me, to be able to stand up next to her and to be able to put a ring on her finger, standing up. That, that was the driving force behind me wanting to wear my legs, and it was, it was a case of there wasn't anything that was going to stop me from doing that. The day finally came in April 2007, a year later than planned. Among the guests were those who had helped Danny, from hospital staff to his rescuers from the tunnel. For everyone involved, I think it was a very emotional event, um, just to see the result of all the hard work that, that Danny had put into to getting better. To be able to see Danny stand at the altar and welcome his bride down the aisle and to actually get go through the whole ceremony standing was an achievement for him. And I'm sure Lisa, I could see it on her face, she was very happy. She was the only person I wanted to be with within two weeks of meeting her, so we was engaged after two weeks. The, the whole way through this, there's never been any question that she wasn't going to stay with me. She was there from the moment I was in hospital and she stayed with me the whole time. She's never looked at me differently. She's never let my disability or my injuries change how she feels about me. I'll give you this ring. As a symbol of our marriage. As a symbol of our marriage. All the way on, Lisa. <laughs> Don't break his finger. <laughs> <laughs> to be able to stand there and say our wedding vow was a, a big sort of like, we, we've, we've done it, we've, we've reached the point where this is our life now, this is our time, and we move on from there. I always said if he didn't want to stand up and he was going to be in the chair, then, you know, for me, no problem. I, I love him any which way, but for him, he needed to do that for himself, to prove it to himself, and not just for that, but for everybody else to see. It was a culmination of two years' real hard work to, to get to that point, to be able to have everybody that, that we love and care about and that have helped us get to where we were in, in one room and say, look what you've helped us achieve. Danny had achieved his goal of standing at the wedding. But as he began his married life, he would have to decide if his future was on legs or in a wheelchair. Okay. Danny Biddle is visiting the Douglas Bader unit in Roehampton for a routine checkup. It's been two months since he achieved his goal of standing at his wedding, but he hasn't used his prosthetic legs since. So have you been getting pain in the left side when you're not wearing your legs? Yeah, it's when, when I move, it feels like it's constantly catching and right. tearing at the skin. OK. That night sort works well, though. Does it? Yeah. That's for your, your phantom feeling, yeah. so that's good. OK. On Danny's um, through-knee side, where he'd lost the leg um, going through his knee joint, effectively, that is a good um, stump and leg left for Danny. Yeah, that's good. When it comes to his other side, on his above-knee um, leg, 
um, Danny presented with a very, very short stump or residual limb. Um, and this has a tendency to make limb fitting very, very difficult. It's, it's not so much um, draining of energy, it's, it's frustrating because there's so many bits that have to line up in certain ways and, and do up certain ways that you can put the legs on and stand up and it not be right. Some days you, I put the liner on, bolt the leg in, goes on first time. Other days I can spend 40 minutes just trying to get one leg on. Eventually you think, like, why do I believe now why am I doing this? This is, this is on its own killing me, let alone anything else. That's got it. Achieving what he's achieved, um, he's been absolutely outstanding. But long term, I think there's probably a frustration there that he so, so wants to walk um, and function normally. But often, because of the nature of his injuries, life outside a hospital is probably easier for him in a wheelchair than it is with his walking. Ready for action? Go. Check your brakes are on. On Danny's left side, okay, with the shorter okay. stump, he is feeling the effects of what is known as calcification. Good. Just where the, the bone that's left from where my leg was. Um, because it's a live bone, it's releasing calcium, which solidifies and creates a bone growth. Good it's excruciatingly painful. It's, it, the actual sensation inside the, the small stump is, if you imagine a boxing glove full of needles, that every time you move, someone punches you with it. That gives you some idea of, of what it feels like. All right, we'll just see if we can just walk or just across the room, Danny, and right then back that. down. Back. Yeah, so just take I mean, even now, nearly two years after the bombing, there, there's still an immense amount of anger that builds up every time I, I look at the legs and every time I, I put the legs on. Push, place. The legs are a reminder of what I can't do, not what I can do. Given the pain he suffers with the prosthetic legs, Danny has been advised to temporarily stop using them. You look a bit red around there. I've got an well. assessment again in October, and then pretty much that's going to be make or break as to whether or not I'll be able to, to use the legs. But if I can't use them, then I've achieved a lot from being in a wheelchair, and I'll just carry on striving to achieve more, whether it's on the legs or, or from a wheelchair. Underneath that. I have a very strong hatred for the man that did this to me. That's not because of the colour of his skin, that's not because of his religious beliefs, that's because he blew my legs off. I've had Muslim nurses and doctors look after me and give me such tremendous levels of care that, that you can't try and tire everybody with the same brush. It's the wrong thing to do. I hate one man and one man only, and that's the guy that put me in a wheelchair. Danny continues to suffer from mental trauma, especially nightmares. He and Lisa have developed their own strategy for dealing with it. Right. The uh, audio books we have on of, a, of an evening of a night time before we go to bed, and Dan often puts them on in the middle of the night if he wakes up from a, a nightmare. He can't have complete silence because otherwise it just makes it much worse for him. So, first of all, we couldn't sleep in the dark; we had to have a light on. Now we've gone to just having where, um, where our CD player's got like a blue light that stays on until the timer goes off, and that's enough for Dan to so he can if he wakes up he's got that and he knows where he is because a lot of the time he wakes up and he doesn't know where he is, so it's quite scary for him. Sure. Normally he wakes up shouting, um, please help me. That's his normal thing, to be honest. Um, and then he's, he wakes up, cold sweat. We put the air conditioning on so he can cool down. And then we put something on and he tries to go back to sleep. The feeling when I wake up is the feeling that I'm back in that tunnel. It's as real now as it was 22 months ago. And that, I don't know if that feeling will ever go away. Over the last two years, Danny has contemplated the chain of events that have forced him to spend the rest of his life in a wheelchair. For me personally, I think that, that the government have got a lot to answer for. The recent trials that have gone on, they mention Khan's name, they've got information linking into it. They've not just found that information, they've had it all the time. So then how far back does it go? Which is when myself and other people have said there should be an independent inquiry. Let's find out how much they knew, when they knew it, and could it have been stopped. I can't believe they went to war in Iraq and didn't think there'd be repercussions. I honestly feel they looked at myself and other survivors and, and other bereaved families as collateral damage. Khan and Tanweer made a video saying that they will do this because of our foreign policies in Iraq. Now, the Home Secretaries that have been and gone since the 7th of July, they all said it's not connected. 
What more evidence do they need to say the two are linked? But the arrogance of the, the individuals concerned, they can just brush it to one side, and no, that's not, not connected. And nobody's got the bottle to say we made a mistake, but we're going to put it right. We're going to learn from it, and we're going to make sure it doesn't happen again. I'm a projects manager for a construction company. I'm not military related. I don't make decisions of what this country does and who we go to war with. But yet I've got to live the rest of my life suffering through the consequences of our government. You just have to make a decision that, that you won't let these people win. Every day is a struggle. But when I go to bed at night, I know I've won another day. My disability doesn't stop me achieving what I want to achieve. My own mental barriers do. What disservice would it be to my heroes, my rescuers that saved me, the people that died, their families, if I just didn't live my life? If I've chose to get up every morning and go to work, I've chose to go to college and get married, I've chose to live my life. It's new beginnings, new challenges new sadness and new joy, that, that's what life is. I could have died with a lot of regrets. I certainly don't want to ever have that feeling again. <laughs>